today. Uh, we have two professors from here at the Business School, Anna Marie Lissardi, a former student of Dr. Bernanke, I might add, um, and also Howard Beals, uh, the Department of Strategic Management and Policy, who are going to be focusing on some consumer related issues, uh, in protections, and also financial literacy. So I will leave it up to them to govern their own time, and I will sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you very much. It's uh, really great to be here and speak in this course, and I have to say, I'm we are very grateful to Professor Ford for putting this course together. I hope you have appreciated how special it is to be taught by <coughs> Chairman Bernanke. I actually was very lucky to have him as um, one of my professors at Princeton. I have to say, it is that good. Uh, and uh, when I watch him uh, in the first four classes here, you could really see like his uh, kind of role as a professor as well. Uh, what I'm going to talk today and try to bring some attention is look more at the demand side and look uh, at the consumer and the investor. We have been speaking so much in this class about institution, about banks, about financial markets, uh, but I want to bring the attention to one of the important participants in this market, which are the individual consumer and the investor. And the reason to do so is that, contrary to the past, they are now becoming so in such important participant in the market. Uh, and they have become so, so important because of some fundamental reason. First of all, we are really moving to a very different economic landscape in terms of participation to the financial market than 20 or 30 years ago. What has changed dramatically with respect to the past <coughs> is that we are putting individual in charge of their financial well-being. What do I mean with that? One of the big, in my view, really fundamental changes that has happened in this economy, and that will affect you, by the way, very strongly, is this change in the pension landscape. Some of your parents um, had a working firm which had defined benefit pension. But now we are moving toward a very different system. It's called defined contribution. And I'm going to mention this word. Please write it down. Because that's the pension you're going to offer as you will start a new job. Okay? This pension system is dramatically different than in the past. What happened in the past was that the employer got the contribution uh, from pension and was in charge of investing it. So in other words, the CFO with an MBA in finance was in charge of investing the pension at the firm level, and then they would give the worker a promise that they <coughs> will continue to pay this pension when they retire. What we have done now is completely different. As you start your job, we give you a fund with your name. The employer contributes to this fund. You contribute as well. And you choose what to do with that money. OK? So if you choose to invest, and you choose to invest in a bad stock, it's your problem. And if you don't have money, at the end, of your working life, it is your problem. This is really a very, very strong change. And as you can imagine, it has a lot of implication for the financial market. One of the reasons why we see so many more individuals participating, for example, in the stock market, is they are in charge now, with respect to the past, of their retirement wealth. Okay? This change is not going to go away. And there are two fundamental reasons why, in my view, we have moved to this new system. One has to do with market mobility. In the past, people would start at a firm and stay there all their life. Imagine how boring. <laughs> you know, what has happened today, by the age you are 35, you might have changed seven jobs. And what we need, if you change jobs so often, is the previous employer 
Now, if they add your pension, right, what do they do with that? We need pension to be portable. And that's one of the reasons why as financial, as labor market became so mobile, we needed to equip workers actually to be, to not actually discourage that mobility, okay? The other fundamental change is, of course, demographics. People live very long now, and almost no government or employer wants to take up this risk that you live to 100. You know how expensive you are if you live long? <laughs> I mean, you know, we would really love you to die quite quickly. And that would actually solve a lot of problems with our social security. <laughs> so, you know, this unfortunately in every country, uh, we see population <coughs> people living long. And as a result, even countries which are, you know, very, if you want, um, with a strong government uh, orientation, like Sweden, for example, have really moved to a system of private account. And the reason is no one has a capacity to promise you a pension if you live to 100. Now, the problem is we are putting people in charge of financial decision in a moment in which around the world financial markets are becoming very complex. Right? So think of the past what you could do. I mean, think of the opportunity that you have to invest. We have a global economy, right? You don't have to invest in the US. In fact, you should probably not invest in the US <laughs> only. You know, there are so many opportunities around the world where to invest. <coughs> but think of the complexity of financial instrument, almost any financial instrument that you can think of. Right? Even mortgages, in fact, it used to be uh, relatively standard instrument have become extremely complex, right? So here is the problem. We put Joe and Jane in charge of their pension funds, and they have to make decisions confronting very complex financial markets, okay? And when you think of financial markets, please do not think only of investment opportunity. O of course, Financial markets also are credit markets. So not only you invest, but you also borrow, right? So, and that actually has been a very significant change with respect to the past, because you are so young, you don't know that actually there was a world in which there were no credit card. How boring, eh? But uh, there is there was that world in which you couldn't borrow just using a piece of plastic. And in fact, in some countries, you can't use your credit card to borrow. What we mostly have in Europe, for example, are debit cards. I hope you have realized that this is not an accent from Vermont. Um, you know, in Europe, where I used to live, for example, the financial markets are very different. And opportunity to borrow are not as widespread as in the US. In the US, you know, we allow you to actually use a piece of plastic to actually charge uh, to charge goods that you buy even if you don't have uh, money right now, right? So this is quite a remarkable change. And in fact, I would like to say we live in a world where we have shifted the responsibility and the risk of financial market from employer and government to the individual. In the past, Social Security, if Social Security was going to be the only institution who supports you, they are taking up a lot of risk, okay? And we have to think, are they able to like, deal with that risk? Okay, if you live too long, they have to support you, okay? The employer as well, think of all of the big firms. They have frozen their pension, right, and they shift to define contribution. So you are in charge. The individual is now confronted with the risk in the financial markets directly. Okay? We put you in charge of your money, the money has your name, and you decide. And if you have invested in Enron, 
it was not a good investment. Okay? But it's your responsibility to do so. Okay? As you can imagine, if I were Chairman Bernanke, I would be worried about this, right? Because this potentially could create instability in the markets, right? What if a lot of people choose a wrong mortgage? <coughs> you know, if I had asked this question five years ago, people would say, there is no chance that people would choose a wrong mortgage. <laughs> you know, people, why should they? <laughs> right? But as we have seen, and as a Chairman Bernanke probably would have thought more about that question because he had been studying a lot of historical episodes where he had seen that so many things indeed can go wrong. And people might actually not be doing the best in certain cases. So the question I want to talk about today is not about institutions, it's not about banks, it's not what they do, but it's the other question about, so what about consumer? Now you are in charge, okay? We are going to you know, push you out in the world you know, after you graduate from here, and you are in charge. In fact, you are dealing with a lot of financial transaction now. One of the biggest transaction you have made is, for example, to support your education and to finance your education. In fact, one of the biggest investment you have made is the investment in education. So these are important financial decisions, and people are in charge. So the big question we want to ask is, we have put them in charge, but how equipped are they? You know, in the past, a CFO with an MBA in finance, it's not that you know, in the firm, like the employer would choose Joe and Jane to say, hey, you're going to be in charge of the money of your employees, right? I mean, it was the CFO, the chief financial officer with an MBA in finance, normally, you know, potentially from GW, Right, to make this decision. But now Joe and Jane are, okay? They are in charge. So how equipped are they to take up this individual responsibility? And the question is, do we care, right? Why should I care if Kelly, you know, invests in Enron? Kelly, you took the risk, that's life. That's the new financial markets and that's it. You know, should we care or not? Your question. I was just talking, saying that like a lot of people have their parents supporting you for their education, so it's not just like a lot of students yes. I know that they're not putting in money of their own to finance right. their tuition. It's their parents and their family. So. Right. So actually, it's a very very important point, which is a lot of financial decisions and a lot of learning happen within the family. Right? And actually, I want to really touch this point, and I want to show that what you said is very right. First of all, a lot of people have help, and in fact, a lot of people seem to learn from their parents as well. So what is the implication of this, actually, for the current world as well? So let's, really, let's hold off on this question as well, because I would like to ask, how equipped are their pa parents as well, right, since they make the decision? And you know, should we rely on parents, therefore, to teach, you know, financial literacy to their children? Okay? Before I do so, let me start, let me give you a bit of background about kind of this financial crisis and the contribution of financial literacy to this. Um, so a few statistics which I think should be very important for you to understand is, as you look at the period before the financial crisis, this is a period and one of the characteristics of, that makes the U.S. very unique is that this is a country with a zero saving rate, okay? So it's a country that overall where people do not save, <coughs> and this is actually important as well because it might create in itself, in a sense, some vulnerability, right? If you don't have saving, the question is how do you buffer against shocks, okay? People buffer against shock by borrowing. The problem is borrowing had been going on for a while already, so household debt had been increasing quite steadily. In fact, the two might be correlating, that one of the reasons for the low saving rate might actually be the fact that 
not only people were not saving, but they were already shifting resources from the future to the present. <coughs> and one of the things is another reason why borrowing might actually have become possible, or, or the increase for the reason for the increase in borrowing might actually have to do with the fact that we made it possible to borrow. And we have given people two instruments which are actually strangely very similar. So I'm going to argue that subprime mortgages and credit card have one important similarity. What is that similarity? There is actually one thing that make mortgages and credit card very, very similar. There are both ways to borrow. And what is similar with respect to the past is what? The fact that it's the individual who decide how much to borrow. If you think of credit card before the financial crisis, more or less you could continue to borrow by basically charging on the new card you were getting every day. I was receiving three credit cards a day including one where I could put you know, my picture or the picture of my cat. <laughs> you know, so what you could do, you almost had an infinite supply. And this is actually a very interesting feature of the credit market before the financial crisis, which is we give you credit. It's like opening a faucet, OK? It's up to you to draw the water, and it's up to you to decide when it is enough to, to borrow, OK? You wanted to buy a house of $400,000, it's fine. You could find a broker who would provide you the funding. It was up to you to decide whether you wanted 400, a million, 500, 20,000, OK? Nobody with the subprime mortgages, that's the why they are called subprime and not prime. You know, we don't check your document. So you are risky. We know you are risky, but we give you the credit. It's up to you to pay it back. Okay? So we are shifting that responsibility. And if we are, it would be good to know if people actually are able to make financial decisions. So one of the things I'm going to tell you today is try to address this question. How we quit? are people to take up this individual responsibility? Do they know the basic concept of, for example, finance? Right? We teach finance here at GSB for a reason. Right? We don't want you to be the CFO and not know derivatives, <laughs> right? not know balance sheet. You, know, you can't show up at your work and say, I can make financial decision for this firm. Okay? <laughs> You need to know the law of finance. So let's, but the same for consumer. Now, consumer are like firms. If you think of consumer now, an investor, they have to make this financial decision. With respect to the past, these are difficult ones. They are in charge of their children education. As you know, you know think of how much education costs. Achieve it. They are in charge of their pension. Right? They are in charge of choosing a mortgage. They are in charge of managing credit card. Right? And all of these instruments have changed over time. Right? So individuals are like firm. They have to know quite a bit to make this decision. So the question is, what should they know? Should we ask whether they know the black shoal formula? That's the formula to price options. So they know how to buy convertible bonds, right? But what I'm going to show you are some of the questions we design to figure out whether people at least know the basics of financial decision making. So what do you think are basic concepts, or what do you think are some of the fundamental concepts that people need to know to make financial decisions? Think of a few concepts. Uh, you might want to know how much you need um, for retirement so you can save at a sustainable right. rate. Right. So, for example, it would really be good to know how much you need, right? And to do that, you need to make some calculations, 
right? Every financial contract means what? Transfer your resources over time. So what you need to do is have a sense of the value of time, okay? So what we need to know for sure is interest compounding, because that's actually the value of time. It actually measures, and it's also, most importantly, the price of money, right? So that's actually a very fundamental concept that we believe <coughs> are the basic of every financial decisions, right? So do people know interest? Other things, David. I was going to say compound interest. Compound interest is critically important. And what else? Because time, and as I was mentioning, time and value of time, what else do you need to know? And this is very linked to the Fed, if you are really making decisions about how to save for retirement. If we are transferring resources over time, what do we need to be worried about? Uh, Andrew. Oh, uh, the inflation rate. Inflation, right? The problem is, over time, if there is inflation, actually, the value of the money changes. And that's why we care so much about the central bank. That's why we care so much about the central bank actually being there to keep inflation low. Inflation low means you know, we have a guarantee about the value of our money, right? If inflation is 2%, then my, you know, prices have only changed 2%. Imagine if inflation was 10. If inflation is 10% and your investment doesn't bring more than 10%, you are in big trouble, right? So in a sense, you know, we care deeply about this institution and we care deeply about the fact that one of its mandate is keep inflation low. That's why it's so critically important, okay? What else do we think is important? In particular, if we want people now to invest their money for their retirement well-being, if they have to participate in the market, what do we want them to know? Noah? Interest rates. Interest rate. Again, I want to come back to this because interest rate is so important, right? If people don't know the interest rate, I mean, this is a problem. Right? It is as if you go to buy a pair of shoes and you don't ask about the price. You only ask about the color. <laughs> right? you, know, you need to know the price to make a decision. Right? What else do we want to know if we are thinking, you know, we are putting them in charge. They are investors. Right? So, you know, you're, you know, now you have to decide, for example, your parents have to decide you know, where, in a sense, what to do to be able to send you to college. What is one critical thing? for people to make investment decision. They risk. Risk, how to deal with risk. In fact, I'm going to argue that one of the fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental capacity of the financial market is to provide insurance, right? And in fact, you know, risk and risk diversification is critically important. Okay? And in fact, this is actually what we have asked, as if you have read the paper, about how you know, we have measured knowledge of three basic concepts. One actually is going to be interest and interest compounding. The second is going to be inflation. And the third is going to be risk diversification. Okay? <coughs> Let me actually uh, tell you the exact wording of this question. So you're going to see, in a sense, first of all, their simplicity. Okay? No, think about the decision that people have to make and think about the simplicity of the question. I'm going to show you in a moment, okay? And we're going to try to assess whether indeed, you know, people are able to make, you know, are able to really know this very, very basic concept, okay? So the first question I'm going to, we have asked, has really to do basically with basic numeracy. Right? Can people do simple cal calculation in the context of financial decisions? So this is not even interest compounding, right? And actually, we have asked specifically about interest compounding in a question. And I'm going to tell you more about it. But you know, just to keep things simple, we said, but can at least people do some simple calculation? Because at the end of the day, financial decisions are about that. You have to do the calculations. It's very hard to make decision without doing calculation. Okay? So here is how the question is phrased. 
Suppose you have $100 in a saving account and the interest rate was 2% per year. After five years, how much do you think you would have in the account if you left the money to grow? More than one or two? Exactly one or two or less than one or two, okay? So as you can see, the question is very simple. Methodologically, it's very important to also allow people to say, I do not know, kind of refuse to answer because you don't want people to choose at random. Right? And as you can see, is we don't even want you to do the calculation, but we want you to at least indicate what's the right answer. Okay? And the right answer is more than one or two, in case you wonder. Yes? <laughs> so the second question. Here is a question about inflation, framed in the same way of a financial market. Imagine the interest rate on your saving account was 1% and inflation was 2%. After a year in the money in the account, will you be able to buy more than today? Exactly the same, less than today. Okay? By the way, this is a very pedantic question. Right? It's full of econ jargon. I mentioned inflation. Right? So it, and I don't ask if people know about inflation. Right? And also, I'm merely using, in a sense, the language of the financial industry. Right? This is how questions are framed now. And you know, would, would people, in a sense, understand you know, what I'm asking here? So joint knowledge of do you know inflation? And do you know that if, if inflation is higher and your interest rate, you are, using, you are losing purchasing power. Okay? The third question has to do about risk diversification. And it is exactly framed in this way, <coughs> because we asked this in the first time, we asked it in 2004. And we actually try to frame it in a way in which I think it was um, as well described often in the economy. So the statement is, which statement is, is this statement true or false? Buying a single company stock usually provide a safer return than a stock mutual fund. Okay? Again, it is a joint knowledge that you know what the stock mutual fund is and that you know the, what it means to invest in a single company, stock, and stock mutual funds. This question implicitly after Enron failed in 2001 also asks, do you remember Enron? So what have you learned from it? Okay? So these questions are, have been asked more recently in the FINRA Financial Capability Study, and actually I want to distribute briefly <coughs> Um, a, a little brochure that actually describes the financial capability because I want to give you a perspective of how the U.S. population, how much the U.S. population know. So this is the average. I'm going to use a representative sample of the U.S. population. By the way, this is a great data set. It's available online. And you can do it. You can use it for your own research as well. Okay? So how much does the average American know? about interest compounding, inflation, and risk diversification. If you, don't, if you don't get the booklet, it's available online as well. Okay? This is how much Americans know about this topic. 65% can do this calculation, but one in five Americans get this calculation wrong. Okay? Inflation, again, 64% do this correctly. One in five get this wrong. The question which people, where people have more difficulty is the risk diversification. Where half of the population do, do it correctly, and more than uh, one third said, I do not know what this question. Okay? And if you just look at how many people in the US got these two questions that you might actually argue are the simplest one correctly, it's less than half. Okay? And how many people got these three questions right? 30%. Okay. Remember, we are putting people in charge of their retirement well-being, but in fact, they cannot do 2%. Okay. So how about young people like you? You know, because you can ask, well, you know, the general population, you know, like after age 30, people, you know, start their mental decline, <laughs> you know, like, and then, you know, but the young, you know, the young are ready, right? They are just out of school. So we look at this SASI population, 26 to um, 23 to 28. And the great things about them is I actually have a lot of information about them. 
This is on wave 11 of the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. So I look at them at that age, and I can go back 10 years. And actually, I can relate what these people know at that age and how much this is related to their past experience, and for example, to their parents, or their peers, or their friends. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So how much do people know? How much do the young? I have to say the young can do a calculation a little more. Okay? <coughs> but certainly they don't know about inflation. In fact, 30% get this question wrong. Okay? They certainly don't know about risk diversification. Okay? And a lot of them actually said do not know. So if you look at the young, which you know really are in charge of their kind of pension for sure, in fact, 27% of these people only know this question correctly. Okay? And now I'm going to go very, very quickly, because otherwise I don't give you any chance to talk. So not only are this generation, in a sense, not very knowledgeable, but what we find, if we link to some of the characteristics, what we find is that the people who are more knowledgeable are the one whose parents talk about finance when they were teenagers. Okay? So if you look at the literally 10 years before, I have data <coughs> when the parents had stock and bond when they were 12 to 17. The people whose family has stock and bond are more likely to be knowledgeable. Okay? The people whose mother has a college education are more likely to be knowledgeable. Okay? And who is more likely to be knowledgeable? Let me tell you this. We kind of, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, but this is true in every country I've seen, women are less knowledgeable than men. Okay, of course, excluding me. <laughs> so what's and all the, the girls in this class. And, okay, so what's the point here? There is a true gender effect. I can tell you we did this question in seven countries now, including Sweden, Italy, Russia, New Zealand even among the Maori population. There is a gender difference in financial literacy. Why is the case? The case is if you don't teach financial literacy in school, people are learning in the home. But who can learn about finance? Well, probably the family which are educated, the family that can teach you finance. And there is a propensity to teach differently between men and women. Okay? <coughs> and this is going to perpetuate in society if we don't have financial literacy in school. Okay? Now the question you can say, but why do I care? Well, the problem is financial literacy is linked to financial decision. And people with low financial literacy are less likely to deal with that properly, are less likely to participate in the stock market, and are less likely to plan for retirement and accumulate wealth. Not only more recent studies show that it is those with low literacy who defaulted disproportionately on subprime mortgages, and it is also those with low education that did not refinance the mortgages. So the sad thing is that it is the people with low literacy, which are normally with low income and low education, that pay the most for financial services. In my view, that's why financial literacy is so ugly. You know, it is those who know the least that pay the most, okay? So you have an opportunity to decrease your mortgage payments, <laughs> right, to refinance. Those who refinance were disproportionately the high income people, <coughs> okay? Okay, so now what can we do, <coughs> okay? Okay. But is it wise to refinance every time? Haven't, been, haven't people, like, used that to, like, just, like, use their homes as ATMs and that doesn't right. really No, work? no, absolutely, right? And, and that's exact. that brings us exactly to the next point, right? But then what should we do? Should we do automatically refinancing, right? What, what can we do to help people, right? And your, point, your question is exactly on the, on the spot, which is, then what do we do, right? I mean, some things might actually be optimal the way they are, or we might actually do something that doesn't help people, right? And this, I think, really is the big issue with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So did this study control for uh, like level of income? Absolutely. So okay. all of these things, you know, so here I'm trying to be, of course, very uh, brief, but all of these things control for income, education, 
kind of, you know, race, gender. So this is actually the effect of literacy above and beyond all of those characteristics. And actually, your question is very important because there is an independent effect of literacy, by the way, even beyond education. So in fact, going to college is not enough, right? Because if you go to college and you don't major in economics, hint, right? You might actually not be financially literate. So those of you who are going to go in the humanities, do it at your own peril. <laughs> OK? So you know, here is, that's why we talk about protection. That's why we might really need an institution that looks at these little guys, you know? Because we can look at the banks, but how about the little guys, right? The problem is individuals do not seem equipped to make good decisions, but actually we put them in charge. You know, I mean, if we are shifting responsibility onto them, you know, what do we do, right? And the problem is, at least, that, you know, I don't even have to make, in a sense, a strong argument. I don't have to do a lot of philosophizing here because there is a simple, in a sense, externality argument. If enough people make a mistake, Okay, and we have to bail them out, well, it might be helpful to do prevention, right? If the taxpayer has to pay for the mistake that, make, that David makes, right? Maybe we should discipline what David does, right? So, but what do we do? Okay? So, clearly, there is an obvious case for intervention, right? The, the traditional economic uh, this, the issues are, let's reduce the surge cost. Right? Everybody is in charge. First, the decision was centralized. The government or the employer were doing it. Now they are decentralized. Let's reduce reduction costs. That's why we might want to have an institution that provides the information. Right? Or we actually might want to reduce foreclosure. So if you have read the article uh, by Campbell, Jackson, Madrigan, and so on, Actually, there's a very, very a beautiful article by John Campbell at the University of at Harvard University that shows that, you know, in the area where there are some foreclosed houses, the, the <coughs> nearby houses as well decrease in value, right? So if, you, if your neighbor if they actually foreclosed, you are in big trouble because your house is worth less, right? So actually, it's your neighbor who defaulted. Why should you pay? But there is that, right? So we might want to actually regulate because of that. Right? Or there might be macroeconomic instability, and of course, Chairman Bernanke has talked a lot about that. Right? So what do we do? Let me provide just a list of things that have been proposed for mortgages, for example. You know, the hell with all of these exotic mortgages, like where you can you know, borrow everything, and then it's only interest, and then you can put the picture of your cat. Right? <laughs> Let's have plain vanilla mortgages. Right? This is what people, we should offer to people first. Right? Is this a good idea? Right? Or how about now we have disclosure? Right? We want people to be able to compare cost. Right? So we mandate you know, well-provided information, right? not seven point, you know, 50 pages of legalese document. Right? Perhaps what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau should do is mandate one page of information that you should really have right, to compare. And what's that information? And the problem is, do people understand it? Right? They can't even do 2% calculations, for Christ's sake. Right? If I say, well, you should choose an APR of 15%, right? APR, right? and this is what economists know. But you know, Joe and Jane might actually not know. Okay. Or forget about you know, the people. How about the brokers? Let's regulate the brokers. Let's make sure that these brokers actually you know, have really requirement to become brokers, or let's shift to them the responsibility. How about they are responsible? Right? Or how about let's focus on the judge? Right? Well, we limit for a closure by actually providing some modification when you get close to it. These are some of the things that we can do as a regulation, right? But it's potentially problematic. Why is that? The problem is people are different. You know, one size doesn't fit all. Actually, a subprime mortgage 
might be actually good for me, right? But Matthew might actually not default on it, but for me it might be good, right? The problem is individual make many financial decisions. If you regulate the mortgage, but we live on regulating the credit card, or we live on regulating, by the way, the, how, the, the car, right? The consumer financial protection bureau cannot regulate loans on car. You are kidding me, right? I mean, the politician who did that did such a disservice to us. You know how many people like borrow on their cars and buy like the stupidest contract to finance their car? And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau cannot do it. You are kidding me. <laughs> Financial decisions are interrelated, right? Some people said, you know what? We, you know, people don't contribute to pension. We automatically enroll them into pension. Is that a great decision? The problem is if you have credit card debt, probably you shouldn't be enrolled into pension, right? So there are actually big problems, and that's why I'm going to argue that you know, people need the basics. People need to be financially literate, because they are, if they are literate, they probably are the best advocate and the best decision maker. And I'm going to argue that there are actually ways in which we can do financial education and effectively, one of which is at school. <coughs> so one of our objectives, certainly at the center of the Iraq, at the end of Iraq, I'm going to educate all of the GW community so they are financially fit. How about that? Do you think uh, universities should um, like teach these things even if you're not an um, economics or business Absolutely. major? It seems Absolutely. like they're like a Absolutely. lot of colleges we should. ignore that. Right? Not just at, the, at the, you're just at the college level, but earlier on as well. Right? And in fact, actually, my desire is to have a financial literacy for poets. Okay? So there are actually a few initiatives that uh, the government here has done. For example, build a website. We have a financial literacy challenge, which has been an incentive to provide financial literacy in high school. And I really want to conclude with you know, what are potential recommendations for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau including that I think a really important mission is to promote financial literacy so that people at least are equipped to make this decision. That's not enough. You know, we don't teach literature because people can go on and, and write war and peace, but because they can, they can read a good book, and also they can actually choose a good advisor. Okay? So financial literacy is to equip people to live in the current world, and this is my anti slide, which is Financial literacy is like every other topic, as we would not be able to live in a society without being able to read and write, so we, are, we would not be able today to live in a society without being financially literate. So my recommendation for you is that if you don't become an eco major, which is fine with us, at least try to become financially literate. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, a little bit more about the CFPB and where it came from and uh, what it's supposed to do and, and, and about its authorities. Um, the political story for the CFPB was that the financial crisis was caused by a consumer protection problem. Um, and because of that failure to protect consumers, uh, that's what led to subprime mortgage defaults. Uh, and therefore, we need a new consumer protection agency uh, in order to uh, uh, to, to fix that problem and keep it from happening again. Uh, and that was very much the political story that led to uh, the, the CFPB and, and also for, uh, uh, for some of its structures. Um, I want to look first at whether that's right, whether this really was a consumer protection problem or the extent to which it was a consumer protection problem. Uh, and to do that, it's worth looking back at what were the consumer protection concerns that were being expressed as the bubble was unfolding. Uh, and this is from a GAO report in 2004. Um, uh, and top of the list, excessive fees and excessive interest rates on subprime loans. What we clearly know now is these loans weren't too expensive. They were too cheap. Uh, they were way underpriced uh, in terms of the risks that financial institutions were taking. Um, uh, you know, this is a standard consumer protection problem, but you know, that wasn't exactly what was uh, going on here. Uh, lending without regard to ability to repay, um, so-called asset-based lending, that's more of a consumer protection issue. 
Uh, fraud and deception is clearly a problem. Loan flipping refers to frequent refinancings and especially frequent refinancings to take out money. Um, uh, we'll look a little at the extent to which uh, those are actually problems. Uh, I should tell you, I was at the um, Federal Trade Commission from 2001 to 2004. I was the head of consumer protection. Uh, we were busy bringing some of the cases against subprime lending, fraud, and deception um, uh, uh, at that time. So just, just so you know where I'm coming from on that, uh, on that set of issues. Um, what happened as the crisis unfolded uh, was it wasn't that first set of consumer protection problems that people were pointing to. It was teaser rates, all right? an interest rate that's low initially and then resets later to some higher level. Um, those are the short-term, whoops, back. Uh, those are the uh, short-term hybrids in the chart here. Uh, and they were extremely popular in the subprime market. Um, most short-term hybrids were what are called 228s or 327s, um, two years of fixed rate, 28 years of variable rate thereafter, uh, and that's the rate reset at two years. Uh, virtually all of the short-term hybrids um, is at least two years before the rate reset. Um, in this sample, it's less than half a percent of the loans that have a shorter rate reset period. Um, and if you look at loans by type, um, this is the next slide. Um, if you look at the actual percentage of loans that were delinquent, uh, the hybrid loans had much higher delinquency rates at the beginning of the crisis uh, as the crisis unfolded. So it sort of looks like maybe these teaser rate loans really are the problem. All right? It turns out that conceals a different story, though, which is these loans were made at different times. And that's what's going on here is loans of different vintages and not different types uh, of loans. Um, if we look at the actual delinquency rate, this is the left-hand side of the panel here, uh, a couple of things to look at about this right away. Uh, one is the top line here is the loans that were made, subprime loans that were made in 2007. Um, 17 months after they were made, uh, more than 30% of them were in delinquency. Uh, uh, okay. Um, 17 months, there's still seven months before the rate reset. Uh, okay, it's not rate resets that are driving these. All right, these are defaults for other reasons that have nothing to do with the structure of the mortgage itself or the fact that the rate is going to reset. Um, if you adjust the delinquency rate, um, this is what would, what would have been the delinquency rates on loans issued at different times um, if everybody had had the same characteristics and the property had had the same characteristics and house price appreciation had been at the average rate. Okay, so take out all that stuff. What was the effect of different vintage? Well, 2007 still looks the worst by far. 2006 is close behind. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, progressive deterioration in the quality of the loans, all right, in the underwriting standards for the loans over this whole period. Right? And what happened was fixed rate mortgages were made earlier in the period. More of those earlier vintages are fixed rate mortgages. Um, uh, and um, the hybrid loans are, are, are more common later. And there's differences in the quality of borrowers. If we look at different types of loan instruments, um, we've got hybrid mortgage loans here and fixed rate mortgage loans here. Pretty much the same pattern. Maybe some difference in the level, but not very much, and we'll see that that statistically isn't actually there. Purchase money loans, um, uh, cash out refinancing loans, same patterns, all right? And same relative rates of delinquency, all right? Loans getting worse and worse over time. Uh, full documentation loans, same problem, all right? This wasn't that we didn't get documentation. This was that financial institutions made bad loans. Um, uh, okay, the no-doc loans are, are, are worse, all right? but we had the same set of problems in the, uh, in the fully documented loans uh, uh, as well. And then if you look at the fully documented loans, you know, 30% default rates are more than enough to produce a financial crisis. Um, uh, okay, and that's what we had even in the fully documented uh, uh, kinds of loans. Um, what was the cause of defaults? Well, here's the five biggest factors. Uh, not surprisingly, your FICO score, creditworthy bar borrowers, more creditworthy borrowers are less likely to default. 
Um, the second most important factor is house price appreciation. All right? How much did prices go up in your SMSA between the time you took out the loan and whenever we're assessing whether or not you're in default? Uh, okay? uh, in places where house prices were rising, defaults were lower. Right? When house prices started to turn down, defaults went up. The uh, third factor is combined uh, loan-to-value ratio. How much equity does the consumer have invested in this? Right? People with a larger stake in the loan um, are, are, um, are, are less likely to default. Um, the mortgage rate is interesting. The higher the interest rate, the more likely it is to default. You are, the, the, the borrower is to default. Um, that's probably because the lender knows something about the risk. All right, and is pricing that risk by charging the riskier borrowers more uh, uh, for the loan. And indeed, the lender's right. That shows up in the default, um, uh, default probabilities. Um, and the fifth most important factor here is the origination amount. How big was the loan? All right, bigger loans were more likely to default. What was not very important, and I'm going to show you this on the same scale, uh, is the terms of the loan contract itself. Uh, and some of them are sort of surprising. Uh, um, this is the percentage change in the likelihood of default is the way to think about this, right? And this is the same scale, so those, you know, 50% changes from FICO scores are directly comparable to, uh, to the 10% to changes here. Um, the cash out loans were less likely to default. Investor loans are riskier because the investor may walk away. Uh, fully documented loans are a little bit safer, but not dramatically so, right? There's not a huge difference here. Uh, loans with a prepayment penalty are a little bit more likely to default. The margin is the markup uh, over the index rate when the, when the uh, loan resets to a, uh, to a variable rate. Um, and loans with bigger margins are more likely to default. And again, that's the same thing as the interest rate effect that we saw on the earlier slide. Uh, loans with a balloon payment are a little bit more likely to default, but not by much. Hybrid loans, no significant effect. Adjustable rate loans, no significant effect. All right, that's not what was going on uh, in terms of uh, uh, of producing uh, 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 the probability of default. What happened was the loans changed. Um, this is this is actually this picture really su surprised me the first time I encountered this uh, statistic. This is the median loan to value ratio on subprime and alt A loans uh, over the, the the late 2000s. All right, look at the top line here. The median subprime loan from 2005 on was 100% loan, all right? Zero equity. Uh, and that's the median loan, uh, uh, okay? Uh, so the majority of loans, these consumers had nothing at stake, all right? When house prices turned down, they walked away, all right? What we saw in the vintage effects uh, over time as the loans, uh, as the loans emerged, uh, was, um, was concealed, you know, the quality of the loans, the declining quality of the loans was concealed by the housing bubble because house prices kept going up. And as long as that was true, how bad these <coughs> loans were was not clear to people uh, in, in these markets, all right? Um, uh, but, you know, this is, this is uh, um, um, part of what happened here was people had no skin in the game, all right, and no reason to stick with this mortgage. Uh, when times got uh, tougher. Um, well, why did underwriting standards deteriorate, as they clearly did? Well, partly, this is the classic pattern in any credit boom. Um, as the boom is going on, uh, risks look smaller than they actually are. People, uh, people, under, people reduce their standards uh, in order to take advantage of what look like profitable opportunities. And it doesn't much matter what the credit is for or what you're investing in. If you look across credit booms in different countries, different times, you see the same kind of pattern, all right? Deteriorating under, underwriting standards over time. Um, the other thing that contributed to declining underwriting standards was affordable housing goals, all right? For Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Congress said uh, you ought to make more loans for affordable housing to low and moderate income people. Uh, you ought to provide more support for that market. Um, Congress let them count subprime mortgage-backed securities uh, towards those affordable housing goals. So Fannie and Freddie were big investors in subprime uh, mortgage-backed securities. They also each had programs with fancy names to that, that were, in effect, lower underwriting standards for low- and middle-income 
uh, loans uh, in order to meet the affordable housing goals. Uh, okay, um, uh, so uh, and this is this is by the way the SEC is uh, litigating with the uh, principals of both companies uh, for misrepresenting how exposed they were to uh, to subprime loans. Um, the other factor, and this is out of the statistical study we were looking at a few minutes ago, is the Community Reinvestment Act. All right, Community Reinvestment Act says banks should pay particular attention. Uh, to um, low and middle income um, neighborhoods, right? And you can proxy that in the statistical work by the zip code uh, and whether the income in the zip code, and the average income in a particular zip code, is below or qualifies for special treatment under Community Reinvestment Act, right? Holding constant income, people in those zip codes were more likely to default, right? The underwriting standards were different. Uh, for loans that were favored under the Com Community Reinvestment Act uh, than they were for other loans uh, uh, at the time. Um, in any event, the political story was consumer protection problem. That political story carried the day, and we created the CFPB. Uh, okay? It's a new independent agency. Uh, it consolidates the consumer protections from a bunch of different agencies. Uh, the Comptroller of the Currency, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the National Credit Union Administration, and the FTC. Um, uh, and it consolidates responsibility under a whole host of uh, about 30 different consumer protection statutes uh, that used to be in different places and different agencies. Um, the FTC shares jurisdiction with the CFPB. It did not lose jurisdiction. All of the other agencies lost the jurisdiction they had before the, before the CFPB. Uh, all of that authority goes to the CFPB. Um, one thing that does is eliminates any possibility of dispute about who has jurisdiction. Uh, okay, there were disputes uh, in the old system. I was part of some of them. Uh, about is this our, our, do we regulate these guys or do you regulate these guys? Uh, okay, there were, there were gaps in the regulatory structure that the CFPB gets, uh, gets rid of. Part of the thinking of the CFPB creation was a single purpose agency, right? The only thing it's got on its agenda is consumer protection, and we'll come back to whether that's a good idea or not in a few minutes. Uh, we gave it some new regulatory tools, um, uh, and we'll look in more detail about what those are, and some new statutory authority, uh, and again, we'll, we'll look at that as well. Um, CFPB is a pretty unique structure in American government. Uh, there is a single director. Uh, there's other single director agencies. Uh, but in all the other single director agencies, the agency head is politically accountable. Uh, okay? Not so CFPB director. All right? CFPB director is appointed for a fixed five-year term. He can only be removed for cause. Right? No matter how much the president dislikes the choices this director might make, you can't get rid of the guy, uh, okay? All of the other independent agencies, except the Fed, but all of the other independent regulatory agencies, uh, the president can name the chairman of the agency. He can't necessarily replace commissioners, uh, but he can name a new chairman at any time for any reason, all right? So there's political accountability for the agency head that's not there for the CFPB. Um, uh, the CFPB has independent funding. Uh, it gets a specified percentage of the Fed's budget um, uh, as uh, up, to, uh, uh, no, up to a maximum. Uh, the appropriations process for other regulatory agencies is a key accountability mechanism. Right? It's not there for the CFPB. Um, the CFPB is located in the Fed. It's a bureau of the Federal Reserve. But the Fed can't do anything. It can't do anything about personnel policies. It can't oversee its decisions. Uh, all it can do is give it the proper share of its budget. Uh, okay? CFPB decisions can be overturned uh, by the Financial Stability Oversight uh, uh, Council, which is the heads of all the different regulatory agencies. But the CFPB is a member. Uh, okay? So it can still, uh, as a practical matter, to overturn a CFPB decision, uh, you would need seven of the nine other members. Um, to say that the CFPB got it wrong. Um, and there's very narrow criteria um, for overturning a decision. All right? Basically, seven of the nine other agency heads would have to say, this decision threatens the stability of the entire financial system um, before they could say, no, CFPB, you can't do that. Uh, okay? So very narrow criteria, very hard to change. 
Um, the Federal Reserve is the only other organization in government that's that insulated from political control. Right, because we worry about the Federal Reserve responding to political pressure uh, in order to manipulate inflation rates, in particular, over time, um, uh, for political reasons. Uh, okay, there's not that kind of concern about the CFPB, uh, but there is the same kind of independence. Um, is this a good idea to have a single pur purpose agency? Well, economists who studied regulatory reform from, uh, from the 80s, particularly economic deregulation, would say, well, no, single purpose agencies aren't a very good idea. Uh, there really are other priorities. Uh, we care about competition in these markets. Uh, innovation is a key factor uh, in, uh, in competition. Uh, and regulatory requirements usually make that harder. Uh, they particularly make it harder for new entrants. And what happens in the political process is the existing firms say, uh, well, we can live with that. We know it will be harder for other people to enter to compete with us. But for us, that's a good thing. Right? The regulatory process can protect them from competition. Right? So there's incentives to agree to things that may make entry more difficult. Uh, we also care about safety and soundness of financial institutions. Uh, we care about the cost of compliance with these regulations because they're going to end up getting passed on to consumers. We care about credit availability uh, to consumers. Um, it, matters, it matters to the economy as a whole. Right? CFPB's got this single focus, consumer protection, and what agencies with a single focus do is focus on that, that issue. All right? They don't worry about competing priorities. Um, as a result, they're prone to capture. Uh, it may be captured by the industry uh, to doing what the industry wants to protect the industry's interests, and that's happened in many regulatory agencies that were single purpose. Uh, it may be captured by interest groups, uh, where there's outside interest groups that are urging the agency to do particular things, and that's essentially all the agency listens to, right? That's its focus, uh, is the people with, uh, uh, with that group. Right? What happens with capture is agencies ignore legitimate competing objectives. Uh, okay, and that's if, if, it's, if it really is a legitimate competing objective, that's not a good thing. We need to balance these considerations uh, and not just focus on one. Um, CFPB has a new regulatory tool uh, for a great many uh, financial institutions, and that's supervision. Right? What happens on the bank side, uh, and originally this was done for safety and soundness uh, reasons, uh, is there is examination all right, of the bank. Uh, a supervisor comes and visits the bank, he looks at the assets the bank has and the investments it's made and how much risk it's taking and whether it's made good mortgages, he missed the bad mortgages, um, uh, but to assess safety and soundness, is this a well-run institution doing things properly? Right? Over time, what happened is we added consumer protection obligations uh, for banks uh, in particular was the examiner looked at whether the bank was doing the right thing under those statutes as well. So it's more than just safety and soundness, it was also consumer protection uh, uh, objectives. Um, uh, we split that off, all right? There's a CFPB examiner now that's separate from the bank examiner, uh, okay? Uh, but it's still the same examination process for banks. What's new is financial institutions that aren't banks. All right, credit reporting agencies, debt collectors, payday lenders, mortgage brokers, they are all subject to examination. All right, somebody from the CFPB can come in and look at their books, figure out what they're doing, see if they think they're doing right, doing it right, and try to get them to make changes. All right, this is a very different model from enforcement. All right, enforcement, um, uh, and, and I've tried to contrast supervision and enforcement here. Supervision uh, usually resolves problems informally. Uh, okay, the examiner says, we think you ought to be doing it this way, uh, and the institution usually says okay. Uh, there's usually no sanctions for violations in the past. This is a forward-looking process, fix the problem and move on. Uh, there's no publicity, uh, okay? Um, it's a non-public process as the institution brings itself into compliance with what the examiner wanted. Uh, and it frequently seeks to resolve individual complaints, all right? If you call and complain about Citibank, Citibank's examiner will try to fix that problem, uh, okay, in, 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 uh, in, in some way. Um, enforcement is um, you bring a formal federal court action against violators. Uh, there are significant penalties 
Because the idea behind enforcement is let's punish the people who got it wrong in order to deter others so they'll have an incentive to do it right. Um, there's substantial publicity, both because of the amounts of money and because of the, that, that serves the deterrence goal. Um, uh, enforcement uses complaints, but only as a way to identify targets. Uh, okay? Um, in the in supervision approach to subprime lending, all right, insofar as examiners thought there were problems, they fix it quietly and go ahead. Uh, when we thought there were problems with subprime lending at Citicorp, uh, we filed a complaint. We ended up with a $215 million settlement. Uh, okay, substantial amounts of money as a deterrent uh, to get people to, uh, to pay attention. Um, what the regulators hope um, is that supervision uh, will be an opportunity to fine-tune <coughs> compliance. The problem with enforcement is you literally have to make a federal case out of it. Right? And if you think it's maybe a problem but not big enough to make a federal case out of it, there's nothing you can do. All right? Because the enforcement works through making a federal case out of it. Um, uh, for conduct that's close to the line, um, maybe this is legal, maybe not. It's hard to make a federal case out of it, and risky and expensive to make a federal case out of it. Maybe you can fix that through the examination process. All right? Get companies to, to, uh, to, to change what they're doing. Uh, in ways that will be better. Right? What the regulators think is that supervision will let them demand improvement uh, in, practice, in practices that they think are bad, right? but that, that aren't bad enough to make a federal case out. Uh, okay? They aren't bad enough to warrant enforcement action. Uh, okay? This is a much more regulatory approach. Here's what we want you to do. Um, uh, uh, now please do it. Um, what's not clear is how it's going to work. Uh, well, but, but I, before I get to that, um, there's an optimistic perspective on how supervision will work, okay? Because what, what compliance with most consumer protection statutes requires uh, is a balance between competing objectives. We do care about costs, but we do want to we do want to get it right as well. Um, for example, in the credit reporting world, Credit reporting agencies are supposed to use the uh, reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy uh, of the data they're reporting about your payment history. Okay, what exactly does that mean? Uh, uh, okay, um, uh, there's trade-offs involved between the costs of making improvements in accuracy, uh, okay, and how complete the information is. Right, if I don't match information that's almost certainly about you, about you but not 100%, well, I'm leaving information out that may be important to assessing what kind of risk you, you, you pose. Right, so there's trade-offs uh, uh, that are complicated that enforcers often don't understand because right, they're not on the inside of the business. Right? Examiners will be on the inside of the business. All right, they may see those trade-offs more clearly and understand the underlying economic problem more clearly. Uh, and that may, me, may lead to um, better and more sensible approaches. Uh, however, there's almost always room for improvement. Uh, examiners are almost all, always likely to say, we want to see some improvement here. Uh, okay? uh, will that work? Uh, well, ultimately, it depends on enforcement. Um, the examiner's authority comes from the rules and the statutes. Um, there's no, you know, nobody appointed him czar. Um, uh, he's just enforcing the rules. Um, and the CFPB examiners are going to be a little different from bank examiners, right? In the bank process, the bank really cares about the relationship with the examiner because what the examiner says determines what its capital requirements are. They determine its costs of doing business. There's an incentive to keep the examiner happy, uh, okay, and build a good relationship with the examiner. Not so clear that's true for the CFPB. All right, CFPB can't do anything to you except the enforcement action. All right, but the enforcement action depends on willingness to make a federal case out of it. Uh, okay, if the CFPB can't make a federal case out of it, and companies decide uh, they don't uh, uh, they don't want to do it, well, enforcement is the only way to get there. Uh, all right, and how willing the CFPB is, uh, is going to be to do that remains to be seen. Um, banks have usually liked the quiet, non-public supervision approach. Uh, we'll do whatever you want to, just don't say and don't tell anybody we got it wrong. 
Um, uh, okay. Um, other institutions regulated by the CFPB may end up reacting that same way. There is an incentive to avoid adverse publicity. Right? But the examiners don't have as much leverage as they do in the bank examination process. And when they examine banks, they're going to have less leverage than they did pre-CFPB. Um, the um, um, CFPB has statutory authority in three main areas that I want to focus on. Uh, one is disclosure requirements, which is really the traditional approach to protection, to consumer protection in financial markets. Problem with disclosures is information overload. Uh, if you got 100 pages of disclosure, you didn't really disclose anything. Um, uh, okay? And what happens is disclosures tend to accumulate over time because somebody thought the information was important once. It got added to the disclosure. We can never get rid of it. Uh, for example, do you really need to know what the total is of the interest payments over the life of your 30-year mortgage? Well, you know, probably not. Uh, but it's there, a prominent item on the disclosure form, uh, because somebody once thought that that was uh, a useful piece of information. CFPB can and is in the process of reworking these disclosures to make them simpler and more effective. Right? To the extent they do that right, that's a great thing that really will improve uh, the prospects for consumer financial protection. Um, the CFPB can also prohibit uh, unfair practices. Uh, this is an authority that comes from the FTC Act originally. Uh, it's basically a cost-benefit cost test. Uh, if the net effect of a practice is good for consumers, it's okay. Uh, if the net effect of the practice is it's bad for consumers, that's an unfair practice. Right? What it can be used for and likely will be uh, is to regulate the substantive terms of financial contracts to say certain terms are unfair and you can't include them in financial contracts. Uh, the FTC has done that, but rarely and infrequently. They've mostly relied on disclosure. Uh, the third pr provision is a prohibition on abusive practices. Now, this is brand new in federal law. Right? Nobody quite knows what an abusive practice is. Uh, what I've given you here is the criteria for the, uh, for the, de for the definition from the statute. All right? But there's no precedent here. All right? There are no federal abusive practices. Uh, it's not clear how the CFPB will try to use it. What they most likely will do uh, is to use it to um, look at behavioral economics concerns. Right? And essentially what these concerns say is consumers may not always be rational utility maximizers. Right? Um, uh, they may have too little concern for the future consequences of their decisions. They may have self-control problems. Uh, I really should go to the gym every day, but um, you know, it doesn't happen. Um, they may neglect the cumulative costs of decisions that are made over time, like increasing the balance outstanding on your credit card over time. Uh, okay? And the Elizabeth Warren rationale for the CFPB was very much focused on those kinds of concerns, that the CFPB ought to address those kinds of problems. Uh, what that suggests is a greater willingness to t regulate the terms of the contract than we've seen historically, where consumers got to choose. Do you want this contract or not? Right? Here's the information you need to know to make this choice. Now you decide whether this contract is in your best interests or not. Uh, and that really is a more paternalistic approach to regulation uh, than what we've seen. Right? It's imposing the CFPB's preferences uh, on consumers. Um, that, I think, is that. Thank you very much.